It's time for Twig. This week in Google Mac Cuts, Aaron Newcomb, Jeff Jarvis, and I will talk about Google Maps. Where are they? They're missing on my new iPhone. We'll talk about what might have happened there. And Sergey Brin as Locutus of Borg. It's all coming up next on Twig. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twig. Bandwidth for This Week in Google is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twig. This Week in Google. Episode 165. Recorded September 26th, 2012. Shaka. When the walls fell. This Week in Google is brought to you by... Ford. Ford invites tech geeks to join the conversation, submit ideas, and grab a tech geek badge at social.ford.com. And by stamps.com. Use stamps.com to buy and print real U.S. postage the instant you need it right from your desk. For our special offer, visit stamps.com now. Click the microphone and enter Twig. It's time for This Week in Google. And before we go uh, much farther, we have a great panel. I'm going to introduce them. But our, uh, we can finally let it be heard. Actually, let me help. Let me introduce Jeff, because Jeff can help me on this. Jeff Jarvis from the City University of New York, where he teaches journalism, the author of What Would Google Do, and his brand new one, Public Parts. He blogs at buzzmachine.com. Hi, Jeff. Hey, how are you? So our cohort. Uh, we missed dearly, but for good cause. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Gina Trapani was not here last week, and we didn't really know exactly uh, why at first, but she then sent us an email. She said, uh, that her wife had to go into the hospital, and we were a little bit concerned about that. But it turned out she was in the hospital for a happy reason. She was indeed, and right after the show, we got the email and showed it to Leo back in the studio, and that uh, five weeks premature, but they are the proud mothers of a baby girl named Etta. Oh, and let me show you, because she did tweet the picture, so it's public, oh, she did. Oh, I it's didn't public it. knowledge. It's on her Twitter. Dear Internet, last night my oh. daughter was born. Moms and baby are doing great. Meet our new baby girl. And uh, so congratulations to Gina. What What is her wife's name? I forgot. Oh, and you're going to ask me that. I forget. I forget. I should know that. I should know it too. Such a cute kid though. Anyway. Yeah. So we're really happy. Now she's, so Gina has been spending a lot of time in the hospital because uh, baby Etta is a little, not, not badly premature. I think five what, weeks, I think five was. weeks is not, is not too bad. No. So but you end up keeping them longer though when they're that. They want to keep an eye on her. Yeah. She looks like she's doing well. Um, and uh, so they're spending a lot of time there, but uh but that's really great. We're really happy for you, Gina. Congratulations. And she is on cloud nine, as you might imagine. She's just been really happy. Did we send flowers? Can we send some flowers to Gina? <laughs> now let me introduce the panel. So that's why Gina is gone this week. She may be gone a few more weeks because she really does want to be there for baby Etta. But she assures us she's, she's not abandoning the there. show. Yeah, she will be back. Uh, with us now from Google, Matt Cutts, who's in charge of fighting spam. On the Google hey, Web search results. Great to have you back, Matt. Good to be back. And also, uh, we he seems, he seems to be living uh, <laughs> here lately. Uh, we welcome uh, also Aaron uh, from uh, Oracle or Sun or Witch. I can't uh, ever... just go with the source show. Um, <laughs> That's that way better. It recuses my, uh, me of saying anything I wouldn't want to say. A Aaron so. Newcomb, who is a, a, has his own podcast called uh, uh, the, source the Source Show. Mm -hmm. The Source at thesourceshow.com, but also is a regular on Floss Weekly and right. uh, was just on Alan Ball about Android like like a couple hours yeah, ago. Yeah, right, literally. <laughs> yep, last night, so. <laughs> anyway, it's great to have you, Aaron. Thanks so for having me. We'll make, this, we'll make a deal. When we talk about Java, you can recuse yourself. When we talk about uh, <laughs> Google, you can recuse yourself, Matt. And that way, uh, everybody will be happy. Because we are going to talk about Google just a little bit, in fact, quite a bit. Yeah, uh, there's lots of news. Our top story really uh, has to do with Google Maps, and this is a story that's been breaking... Uh, even as we speak. Uh, so as most people by now know, certainly if you listen to any Twitch show, we've been talking about the fact that Apple booted Google Maps in iOS 6, replacing them with uh, their own Maps product, which they had talked about uh, in uh, at WWDC in uh, June. Uh, and in fact, it turns out, according to many reports, uh, that June was when Google learned about it. They were a little shocked because... Apple had over a year left on its contract. We had initially heard that the contract had run out. Uh, this story by Chris Ziegler in The Verge says uh, that his sources say 
that uh, two independent sources familiar with the matter say that the, uh, the the agreement had another year to run, and uh, Google was sent scrambling to develop an iOS Google Maps app, an app with which both sources say is still incomplete, currently not scheduled to ship uh, for several months. That kind of now clarifies Eric Schmidt's comments of two days ago, where he said, "Hey, what are we supposed to do? Force Apple to include our Maps product?" Uh, and uh, others who have said, well, we want to be on every platform. It's clear that uh, this was a business decision on Apple's part. And, of course, Apple's getting a lot of heat because the uh, iOS maps, some say, uh, are not as good. Now, I think it depends a lot on where you are. Uh, according to people I've, I've heard from in China, it's actually better. Apple bought data in China that was better than the data Google was using. It's mainly in China. a data problem, right? Yeah. It's a data well, it's a data no, source issue. It's not just data yeah. source, as Tom Tom was quick to point out. They said it's not our fault. That's where most of the data mm. for Apple's maps come from. It really seems to be, and I think this is pretty clear from the way Google works. This is it's a question of merging source disparate sources. Mm. Always a problem because it's an impedance mismatch. So there's you know, there is there are GIS standards for mapping data. But it's more than that because it's not just mapping data. You also have, have points of interest, which Apple's getting from right. Yelp and other places. Those have to somehow be properly merged in. Uh, Google Google said uh, last week that they've been working on this for 400 years. Matt, can you explain that uh, number? Because Actually, that's a, that was an interesting – the headline on that story said Google's been working on it for over 400 years. But <laughs> Google never said that. You know, <laughs> I hate headlines. <laughs> yeah, like, I get bit by headlines mean? every single show. I don't, so what – Google was essentially saying, though, that a lot of manpower – yeah, there have been a lot of stories that point out that mapping is really hard, getting yes. the points of interest, aligning things, all those street view cars. There was an article in Business Insider several months ago that claimed 7,000 Google employees work on maps in various different ways or, or Google contractors and people like that. So, I mean, mapping is fundamentally a very hard problem. And, uh, and, and you know, that's just the reality of the situation it's it's going to be a difficult problem so yeah i wonder whether google isn't you know I, I i probably wasn't planned this way but i wonder whether google isn't just as well off for at least some delay because uh apple maps are getting some crap out there people do miss their google maps and gee it was apple's fault not ours and uh, maybe maybe some of you don't really want to go run it out to buy that new you got to be really careful though in in uh, in today's world you can you can't be too anti competitive so I, the last thing you'd ever hear Google say is, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, you go enjoy those Apple Maps. We still got some good maps over here on the Android side of the equation. Uh, well, but I well, think that that's was, the case right now, yeah. anyway. And you're right, it's probably good for Android. Well, and it was kind of funny because, uh, you know, I'm far enough away that I don't, I don't know all the internals of those kinds of negotiations, of course. But, you know, you read the headline or the story that says there was a year left on the contract. And, and that, you know sounds plausible I, I can definitely believe that but it is the kind of thing where if you've seen the the tumblr of the different ios 6 stuff uh there was one that had uh, a route to the san jose airport and it went over the you know the runway and so that you really wouldn't want me, to follow that right. map uh but yeah that, that made <laughs> well, me gasp but uh, but it's definitely the case that it'll get better over time right it you know this yeah, is, is this would, is the tumblr that you're talking about the amazing ios 6 maps Yes. <laughs> the amazing iOS 6 maps uh, dot Tumblr dot com. I've got a few of them uh, here and, and they are they're, they They really show a world that is very different. <laughs> For some reason, that's white. I don't know why somebody painted the landscape white there. Here's the one you were. Uh, the Helsinki Central Railway Station is a park. But, you know, you expect this. This is it's a big world. I don't yeah. expect it. This is Apple we're talking about. I personally feel like they should have tested this a little bit more thoroughly before they put it out. Yeah, but, you know, how many of their services have they messed up? Remember back to various of their cloud services that were horribly messed up at the beginning. They make products a different way, but services at Apple have never been, well, not never, but have often been messed up on launch, no? Yeah. I, <laughs> apparently the Huey Long Bridge is available at Home Depot. Uh, that's, that's good to know in New Orleans. New Orleans is actually more messed up than, than other, many other cities. The, it was a hubris, you think, that Apple uh, thought it could do this? It was interesting because, remember, just before WWDC, Google held a hastily convened mapping event. 
at which they showed the 3D, the new 3D map views that they were getting by plane. And, and I think uh, there have been a number of articles before the iPhone 5 was announced and before it came out. Uh, people invited into the secret Google Mapping Center and a tour of how we're doing it. It's clear that all along Google's been saying exactly this. This is hard stuff. We know it. We've been doing it. Nokia could probably make the same case. Nokia mm -hmm. has been doing a very good job with its maps, which are used by Bing uh, and by Amazon and, of course, by Windows Phone and Microsoft. Um, is it hubris? Did Apple did Apple bite off more than they can chew? I mean, to me, it certainly feels like it was rushed. And and you're right. I mean, even Google Maps when it first came out wasn't you know like it is today. It's taken time, but and it's still not perfect. It's still by not the way. Perfect. There's always little problems. But right? it just feels really rushed. And I wonder if there there to me that's the more interesting thing to think about. Was it a rush to get away from Google, or was it a rush to get because they really saw the intrinsic value of all the data that comes from having your own maps and getting people reporting their locations back to you? Or was it just coincidence that it just happened to be, you know, they happened to not see these problems when they were testing it? I don't know. It's very okay. clear that this is from a, a business decision. Mm -hmm. And I think some of the criticism Apple's getting is from people who said, hey, Apple, you used to say you cared about users and the user experience, but clearly you've made this decision that is not best for user experience for business reasons. Mm -hmm. But come on. I think only somebody totally naive would believe that Apple doesn't make decisions for business reasons. They're a business. Yeah, but the question is uh, not that so much as do they have the discipline they should have, which is, a, you know, I think what you're saying. Um, I don't know. You know, is the magic gone? We, you see stock stories now wondering whether it's hit its peak. Uh, we'll see. The amusing thing for me this week is, is, is as you see, Leo, they, they've been trying to, Google's been trying to push Google Maps. And of course, it just released um, uh, street view in the ocean. And the joke there, of course, is that Apple Maps will take you, d d dump you into the ocean accidentally. <laughs> Google on purpose. At least we'll show you what you're, what you're looking at. <laughs> um, I, I also think that um, uh, this is more than just business in the sense that let's screw Google. I think what really is going on oh, here yeah. is that every company has realized that mobile and location mm -hmm are the future. And if somebody said this on Twitter, I think it was Peter Rojas of Gadget, that Apple is a was a computer company. Let's not forget, that's its genesis. And and realized at some point that uh, mobile was where it was happening. I mean, all they had to do was look at the sales of their iPhones, which they make far more money on now than they ever did on computers. And that in order to compete, and Nokia realized this too, Nokia spent something like $10 billion to get to have a foot in mapping and mobile. Even Amazon is going to mapping because they want to deliver to you locally. Mm -hmm. it's, where, it's where the world is moving. So if you're going to compete as a company and survive as a company, you need to be strong in mobile and location, right? Yes. That's the data. Yeah. That, that, that's the, the first layer of data for targeting. Especially when you when you are, have mobile devices and mobile services, you know where is the nearest pizza is is the beginning of the small data you need. Um, Contra, who has a Contra Counter Notions uh, blog, um, and this is quoted by uh, uh, Jean Louis Gasset in the Monday Note, says, in answer to the question, why didn't Apple kick Google Maps, or why did Apple kick Google Maps off the iOS platform? Shouldn't Apple have waited? His response is, waited for what? For Google to strengthen its chokehold on a key iOS service? Apple has recognized the significance of mobile mapping and acquired several mapping companies, which they did, and they, they, they were on a buying spree over the last year. IP assets and talent. In fact, we heard from TechCrunch that they're actively courting Google Map contractors, trying to get them over to Apple to help out. Mapping is indeed one of the hardest mobile services, Contra goes on to write, involving physical, terrestrial, an aerial surveilling or surveying, uh, data acquisition, correction, that's maybe where Apple's fallen down, tile making, and layer upon layer of contextual info married to underlying data, all optimized to serve often under trying network conditions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, like dialect recognition or speech synthesis, thanks Siri, mapping is one of those technologies that cannot be, and this is, this is the important point, cannot be fully incubated in a lab for a few years and unleashed. You need True. to put it out in the wild for it to mature. And that's what you said, uh, that Google Maps, Jeff, when they came out, weren't great. But they've been around now for how many years? And right, they've, they've been collecting a lot of user data. So they have gotten better. Apple needed to do this. Apple's never been hesitant 
to to take a you know to to bite the bullet and do something that's tough in Bruce order Meyer to be competitive. Used to get, brag about the number of data points they've gathered on the maps right. through use, which really matters. But as I said on the show last week, though, I think it does become a new splitting point here. Is that the reason that I have now switched to my Android phone is because of Google services. Yikes. Right. And it's my it's my Gmail and my calendar and all that. But Maps is one of those. And I think that for for iOS users to say, oh, we have the latest phone, we have the latest phone. And well, where do what happened to my darn maps? And yeah, it's a business decision on Apple's part. But the other thing you have to ask is, don't you have to super serve your customers? And if your customers do want that option, uh, shouldn't you know, another option for Apple would have been to leave both on. And the Apple fanboys would have gone to, to Apple Maps. They would have had time to work it out. They could have pulled it over, and then they you know, could have pulled it out of iOS 7 or something. Uh, instead, the, the switchover before they were ready, not so cool. I don't, unless there was a not-compete clause that Apple, you know, in the contract that Apple couldn't have its own mapping, but I doubt that. How about this? How about we're seeing, and I actually applaud this, at least because it makes our job much more interesting. We're seeing a couple of companies, Apple and Microsoft, take massive chances, risk pissing off their their embedded base of users with Windows 8 and, and this new Maps thing in order to move forward. And that these companies are bold and brave, and this is what we keep saying. We want companies to take chances to be bold and brave, and, and Apple's doing that. Isn't that what Apple's doing? Isn't that a good thing? It's interesting, it's though, risky. It is risky, but uh, like there was an article that came out just today that talked about developers in Windows 8. And some of the article, the comments on Hacker News were saying, well, but we just got used to this one API two years ago and now we got to switch to a new API. Uh, or the risk, I guess, would also be there was a new study that just came out that said iOS's customer satisfaction yes. sort of dropped for the first for time. For the first time and, ever. And so, now, the thing is, it makes sense. And I understand why Apple wants to be the master of their destiny. And so I think... Ultimately, they have to choose on, you know, what the impact will be on users and, and how good they can make it, how fast and, and all that sort of stuff. The main thing I would just say as a Google employee is that there's a lot of love for Apple at Google. There's a lot of articles that want to, you know, push the companies apart or, or try to turn it into an adversarial thing. And, you know, we... We ro mostly run on Macs whenever the engineers are in the meetings. I'm like the one guy with the Linux computer, and it's all MacBook Airs all around the table other than me. And so there's a lot of people that use and love Mac products at Google. So it, it would be interesting to, to learn how Apple's feeling about it on their side. But um, I don't I'm, I'm sure that many, um, if not all, Apple engineers use Google, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think you, you, this, you know, I remember waiting in line in 2007 for the first iPhone for six hours. I was sitting next to two Google engineers who were, a work, who were working on Reader, and they told me they had spent the last 48 hours sleeplessly updating Reader to work well with the iPhone, so I think you're absolutely right. I think, and I don't think that love is gone, at least among the, the ground level troops. These are high level business decisions, and what we're seeing is a battleground. And and Jeff, we've talked about we talk about this on yeah. almost every show. This is a battleground yeah. now. Location is a battleground for Facebook, Amazon by saying we're going to do Maps too. Mm -hmm. We're going to use Nokia Maps. They're saying we're in this to everybody. This is what the that's what this Kindle HD Fire HD is all about. It's location and it's mobile. And um, and I think that Apple's doing what it had to do. And under, I think Apple fully understands the risk. Well, you know, Leo, Leo, you, you, as you just talked about this, I hadn't thought about this way before, but I've argued that we are moving in the economy, in many cases, from vertically integrated industries to ecosystems with platforms and entrepreneurial development and then networks, right? That one replaces the other. The funny thing here is what's happening in, in the former world of platforms is they're going back into being vertically integrated industries. So that each one of these has... Uh, software, it has services, it has hardware, um, and that's Amazon and Apple uh, and, and commerce, and that's that's Google and Amazon and Apple, uh, all of them doing all of those things. You know, it's part of the reason that I, I guess uh, Arrington keeps on trying to yell at um, Facebook and Twitter that when are you going to get your phone? Because everybody has to operate the same, and I'm not sure that's true at all. No, I think but, face, there's but a good example where integrated industry. There's a good example because Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg said this over and over: we're not going to build a phone. We don't need to build a phone. We need to be on every phone that's built. Right. 
Yeah. So maybe that is the other thing. Maybe Apple and Google could have worked together. It's okay. You, but but that, the question is, does Apple get access to that data that is so important and so valuable That's to Apple? Key. They don't, That's right? Key. Google right. gets well, the data. And what right. do they want to do with it, right? Facebook, uh, you know, there's stories out about how they're changing their ad structure. And, and, and Facebook wants to deal about relationship data. Google wants to deal with relationship data because it can make a fortune on that in terms of advertising and now commerce and, and services. Um Amazon can do that. The, the odd thing to me in this equation is I don't see how Apple benefits from relationship data. Yeah, they can sell me some songs and sell me some you know, movies and stuff, but that's kind of where it ends. They're they, not really in they the restaurant think, business. Well, that's the question. I think Apple thinks it's in the hardware business, but maybe... But it's not in the advertising business. Right? No, They're it's in the hardware to... business. Mm -hmm. Right. But is that is that sufficient? Is that worth all of this effort? I mean, yeah, it's the most it's the most valuable company in the world, so I guess it is. Uh, but um, I understand the strategy of data, data, data for those other three companies. I don't see a strategy yet out of Apple for how it uh, Good point. really maximizes and optimizes the ex exploitation of that data. Good point. Do you, do you guys think I'm wrong? I, I think they're building the foundation of that right now. I, mean, I think that's what this is all about. Yeah, maybe they can't capitalize on it right now with what they've got, but that's what this is all about. They're building that foundation. They're gathering that data, and I'm sure you'll see services come out um, based on this data later, like in future releases. That's a reinvention of the company now. Yeah, right? absolutely. But they've taken like what yeah. they've done with iTunes, for example. I mean, that was they were one of the pioneers of this. But they I always think. said, we don't make money on iTunes. It's to sell hardware. Uh, true. They do make a cut, though, right? They so, make thirty percent, so, which just they say. No, I don't know. Claim covers the costs. If it's in their interest, in other words, to to recommend another album based on you know my interest, let's say right. I'm interested in this, this, and this. Wouldn't you like to buy this? I mean, they want to sell they, more albums. They want to sure. sell more stuff. So I think that you know, both in the hardware business and in other things that they'll come up with, it's about differentiating their their hardware. In this case, the iPhone. Um, in future versions with the data that they're getting right now or they will be getting from their map services. All right, let me throw an, another data point in that may change everything. You want another one? This article yeah. just published in All Things D by John Puchkowski, who has excellent sources uh, in Apple. He says <laughs> the talks between Apple and Google over maps crashed over voice-guided directions. Multiple sources familiar with Apple's thinking say the company felt it had no choice but to replace Google Maps because of a disagreement over turn-by-turn. -turn. Spoken turn-by-turn -turn has always been offered on Android as a free service, but it was never part of the deal that brought Google's Maps to iOS. Apple wanted... Now, this, this is going to turn everything upside down. Oh. <laughs> Apple wanted turn-by-turn... And Google wouldn't do it. It wasn't part of the deal, and Google would Google's wouldn't. the one that wants to differentiate Good. in that scenario. Apple pushed Google hard to provide the data it needed to bring voice-guided navigation to iOS, but according to people familiar with Google's thinking, the search giant, which had invested massive sums in creating that data and views it as a key feature of Android, wasn't willing to simply hand it over to a competing platform. This changes the conversation entirely. It, it's that's, now that's saying that's Apple wanted parity with Android, and Google said, nope, we're going to keep that benefit, which is a huge benefit. And as a, is, I think it's the reason a lot of people move to Android mm -hmm. is not just turn by turn, but turn by turn with Street View. Mm -hmm. So that when you pull up, Dvorak like, discovered this and he can't stop talking about it. Like, John, it's been here for years. <laughs> when you pull up in front of a place, it shows you a picture of where you're going, mm -hmm. which is hugely valuable. Oh, yeah, that's where I'm going. Uh, Apple wanted it. And Google said, no. How about that? So that says that, that, that right, it turns it on its head. That yes. says that I'm full of crap and that the strategy in this case Notice is I saved that till after you. I, let you, I, let you, I gave you let a bunch of ropes. Uh, <laughs> no, because I think both performance. points of view are commonly held. Well, not both points of yeah. view. Your point of view, and I would say I held it as well, is that this was Apple saying, hey, it's time for us to get in location and maybe... Is Apple just think saying that it would really hurt? So, so that goes back to my earlier crack about Google saying, "Hey, what the heck? If we're not on there yeah. for a few months, Big what deal. is it?" Very interesting. I don't know who's right on this one. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. One source familiar with Apple and Google's negotiations told All Things D, "Quote: There were a number of issues in flaming negotiations, but voice navigation was the biggest. Ultimately, it was a deal breaker." And that's when Apple quietly began acquiring mapping companies, fast-tracked develop of an in-house maps app with turn-by-turn, -turn, right? With an eye toward making it a tent pole feature of iOS 
six, and that's when it decided to dump Google Maps entirely. Now, I think because uh, of the uh, brouhaha over Google Voice, the Google Voice app, where Apple did not approve it for a long time, didn't say they hadn't approved it, just didn't approve it, mm -hmm. and then got a letter from, uh, was it uh, Markey? I can't remember, somebody in Congress and then the uh, Department of Justice saying, hey, uh, can you explain this, uh, Google? <laughs> Why are you saying no to And they said, oh, no, no, we did not approve it. We approve it. It's approved. <laughs> so I have a feeling... Uh, and ever since Chrome and everything has been, you know, instant. So I have a feeling, even if Apple would like to say no to a Google Maps app, that they'll have to say yes. The rumor is that there is one in development, but it won't be available until maybe Christmas at the earliest. Mm -hmm. you, you, Matt, I, and I, I want to say this up front, is not speaking for Google uh, when he's yeah, on this yeah. show. He's and I'm far enough away that, you know, all I all I know is, you know, whenever I can test software internally at Google, I enjoy testing it. But I have no idea about okay. what negotiations happen or, or, you or know, whether, whether there's an app in, that in development. You can, you can tell us what you're dog fooding then. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell yeah, us. Do you have a, an <laughs> iOS Google Maps app uh, lying around? Well, well, no. Unfortunately, I use I use the Galaxy Nexus, so oh, I, I, I wouldn't know anything. Convenient. About that. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. We don't. You know, we'll never get Matt back if we do that kind of thing. We <laughs> we don't we don't ever mean to put you on the spot. No, hey, hey, we're nicer than spammers. Hey, let's talk about that. Oh, I want to take a break. We come, we come back. Matt got a nice letter uh, uh, from uh, Senator John uh, D. Rockefeller uh, uh, on Tuesday. I'll put him out. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that letter that. Uh, Rockefeller said, not just to Google, but to Microsoft and Yahoo. But first, a word from our friends at Ford who believe in social, too. Now, you would think, what? come on, it's a car company. And this is I, one of the things, one of the reasons that we're really happy to have Ford as a sponsor. And I think one of the reasons that Ford is uh, so visible in new media and podcasts and on websites is because they really are excited about the potential that uh, the 21st century consumer electronics technology like smartphones and social media can bring to a, a, a 20th century uh, industrial company like an automobile company. And I think they've done it better than – I know they've done it better than anyone else. I first really fell in love with uh, Ford Sync in my 2010 uh, Mustang. And I and you know I've been singing its praises. And then they added app links so that you could have uh, your smartphone apps talk to Ford Sync. So you could actually bring new apps into the car just by bringing in a, a, a smartphone. And now they've created a social site to help share the ideas – help uh, you learn about it. They've got a bunch of great articles, and I admit uh, they're great because I wrote one of them. Uh, actually, an interview I had with uh, Jim Buchkowski, who's a, a lead technologist at Ford. And one of the things I asked him about was the AppLink API uh, for Sync and what apps might be coming. We also talked a little bit about uh, autonomous vehicles because I know that's something you all are very interested in. You can find that article here, uh, along with a lot of other articles about uh, Ford Technologies, your stories, of course. And I love this, a, a social suggestion box. Repl Here's one. I love this. <laughs> I don't you know, and you can vote on these <laughs> ideas. Replace the windshield with a 4K LED flat panel HD display with night vision capability. The vehicle would have a steel metal covering where the windshield would be. I, You know, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. But that's what's cool about this. This is a place where you could put your ideas, however however futuristic or crazy or whatever, people can vote on them. You can read what other people's ideas are. And uh, you can see images and videos of Ford uh, owners and their vehicles. And, of course, grab a badge. And there's some great badges. Uh, I probably would get the pony car badge. But there's lots of other ones, including I love this, the tech geek. You're not uh, just ahead of the curve. You're the one leading it. Get the Tech Geek badge. I want this badge and put it on Twitter, Facebook, Google+. Plus. Uh, send it to your friends. <laughs> Add it to your email signature. I don't know. Whatever you, <laughs> whatever it is ki the kids do with badges these days. I'm going to make a sash. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah and beautiful. embroider some badges. I'm going to make a dickie. <laughs> <laughs> whatever floats your boat, Mr. Dukum. <laughs> Social... Social dot Ford. Just something about the word dicky. It just it makes you laugh. Do kids still wear dickies? No. Oh, okay. Kid people are watching have no idea what you're talking about. Oh no. What's a dicky, Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me that, son. Uh social dot Ford dot com. Go there today and have some fun with it. It's really a great site. And by the way, the new twenty uh, thirteen fusions are out. The focus is out, the escape is out. Look at the mileage that they're getting now on, even with these EcoBoost engines, even on gasoline engines. But of course, the Fusion 
plug-in hybrid and regular hybrid. I mean, these just, oh, they are doing some great, great stuff. Social.ford.com. Become part of the uh, Ford revolution. Go further in a Ford. So you got an, uh, what, did the, how does a letter from a senator arrive? Is there a, a footman <laughs> with a silver salver? I mean, what? I actually got an email with an attachment. So for people what? who haven't seen the, the article, there it is. Uh, this is the first spam wow. complaint I've ever gotten from uh, Senate letterhead. That's And cool. it actually is a, it's addressed to me, which is, you know, so somebody knows engineer. the right person title? to do. Distinguished engineer. Your title? Yeah, that's my title, which I means I've been it. around oh, at Google long enough. Wow. Know. That's so engineer, comma, Esquire. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yes. Wow. So what's interesting is they did a 20-page report. They had Senate hearings on moving company scams, people who say it'll be $1,200, and then once you get things loaded up, they actually are going to charge you $6,000, and if you don't pay they, the money, they got your stuff. stuff off. Yeah. Um, and what's interesting is that they were really. But that's not your. That, how is that your fault? That's that's a that's, that's a real world scam. It's a real world scam, and and we try to have a very light touch. We don't want to be accused of being the truth police, you know. Mm-hmm. And Google decides what's right about vaccines or global warming or whatever. We try to just reflect whatever is on the web as best as we can in terms of relevance. But what they did really well is they did enough research to find out one of these companies they, they called out in the report was scamming and, and spamming in terms of buying links and doing stuff that violates our ah. guidelines. So the good news is they sent, they've been investigating this for months. It, actually, we launched a search engine algorithm update in April called Penguin. And Penguin tackles, among other things, this sort of links spam. And so there, the traffic to this website had actually gone down by 75%, even without us oh, knowing cool. that they were going to send us a letter. So we'd, we'd, we'd also cracked down on scammy link networks earlier this year, and we mm-hmm. caught them in that roundup as well. So, you know, it's, it's really just a great spam report, and we're going to investigate it more and see if there's more we can do. But I just love that, as always, Google's ahead of the government. That's, that's the way it is. Uh, now, while well, we got you, Dr. Spam... <laughs> Uh, I've been getting, I don't know if you guys have gotten this, I'm getting a constant barrage of what, you know, look like fairly human, you know, they can spell uh, emails saying, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, submitting a blog post to you on all these various topics. And I asked on Twitter with other people getting it and all the bloggers I know said, oh God, yeah, tons of them. Have you seen those, Matt? I have. And so, you know, the spammers, they'll move from the easy types of spam to the slightly harder because they they try to be lazy. So it used to be the case that guest blogging was a very respectable thing. You'd hand write, (laughs) you know, something really thoughtful. There's a lot of guys who are now writing one article and they'll make 50 copies of it, changing a few words, and then they'll ask to to do a guest post on your blog. And they're just doing that to try to get links. So right. it's 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 another form of link farming, in mm-hmm. effect, because but yeah. in a more legitimate way, because th- then they're going to get all the Google juice that's available from uh, Jeff Jarvis's blog. That's right. Not and sometimes they are legitimate. Left. Yeah, sometimes they are real. It's just a lot of the times it's it's somebody who's writing 500 words. They don't know anything about it, and they're just basically asking you for a link, and they're going to wrap it in some some prefab text that they've written. I, I right. love I love that they mentioned the Cornell Gymnastics Club in the letter. I don't understand that at all. <laughs> yeah, well, they actually they did enough research to find out where they were getting links from, and so there's like the bo- the muscle building link forum, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Oh, so people. Oh, so there are forums that are not moder- heavily moderated or properly moderated. They're jammed with links. That's right, Spanish and links. and it looks like they'd also been doing a lot of paid links. There was a mm. a link network called. Well, you don't need to worry about the name, but we, we <laughs> caught them earlier this year, and they were participating in that. So you, so this is actually great because this means that Penguin's working. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a, for me, it's a good reminder that you know when we launched Penguin, there were a lot of unhappy SEOs. You know, and, and so I saw this tons a, of people say, "Oh, our rank, you know, we're not right. a we're not a link farm," and they reduced our ranking and. Blah, blah, blah. Well, and, and we do have to be mindful of the impact and the scope of Google's changes. So we, we do try to be very careful about that. But it's an important reminder from across the aisle that there are scammers and they do try to exploit rankings and we have to take strong action on that. Actually, so how did you respond? Did you write, did you write a letter or? You know, uh, I'm sure we will. Google Plus hang sure out? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just hop in and hang out with the senator. Um, yeah. We've actually <laughs> already taken action on several domains. In fact, almost a thousand domains uh, because there were clear spam violations here. Uh, but we're going to keep iterating and improving our algorithm so that hopefully we'll catch lots and lots of sites like this, not just the ones they call out in the report. 
the, somebody... I think it's the beginning of Matt's uh, political career. <laughs> <laughs> I'd vote for him. Uh, I, would. Oh, yeah, I would. I'm just I'm just glad that somebody in government is actually paying attention to this. I mean, it seems historically this kind of stuff gets kind of like, uh, whatever. Nobody pays attention to it. I, I personally, I think this is a big issue, and I'm glad that somebody in our government is actually, you know, taking a look at some of this stuff. Well, I was pre- right, and I was prepared and, and, and to totally. mock it, but it sounds like they actually did their homework, and this was a good, oh. uh, yeah. this was a good report. And what we normally see is people who don't understand how search engines work, right? right? And so we talk – where you guys talk about that every single week. And, oh, yeah. in fact, there was another story in the rundown about a Brazilian judge yeah. who ordered the local president of YouTube to be put in jail. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's really refreshing to see a report where people did their homework, they understand how it works. And then, of course, we want to respond to that and, and figure out how to make things better. Actually, Danny and Aaron – Go ahead. You're, you're right. The tone here was not, oh, Google's done something bad. Technology's done something bad. It's that, you know, we want your help to get rid of these bad guys. And that's right. fine. That's what it ought to be. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Danny Sullivan says this actually is evidence that Penguin didn't work because these some of these are still in the search results. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because when we started to dig into it, we found almost a thousand doorway domains belonging to this guy. So we had affected oh. the main site that they used. But we're going to have to you know, do some research. Making the rank go down by, by three-fourths is pretty good, but those one-fourth of people who are still affected by this particular scammer, that's not a great result for them. So there's always... We're always open to constructive feedback and trying to figure out how we can do things better. And we're going to definitely pour over this report and see what we can do better. It just shows these guys aren't... I mean, nobody would expect you to flip one switch and have it all go away. We have plenty of experience with email spam to know they these these guys are like cockroaches. They, they, find <laughs> yeah. a, they just find another crevice. Well, the interesting thing here, though, Leo, is that this is a case where it, it ends up in a real-world scam, you know, a physical scam. Yes. As opposed to a, you know, wire us money kind of thing. This, there's a truck at your door with big burly guys. Um, We're so seeing more that. and more of that because what's happening is con- – and that's what started with the, those uh, Nigerian uh, email scams. The con men are taking what would normally be real-life cons and bringing them to the internet f- and, and finding a whole new uh, way of exploiting people. I was, I was talking to a real estate agent. Uh, about fake Craigslist listings. And I said, well, how could you fake a Craigslist? She said, what they do is they steal our listings with pictures and everything, create a Craigslist entry, but say the owner is out of the country. So what you should do is mail us some money and we'll mail you a key. Or you should come to the house at 3 o'clock. I'll be there with the keys. Give me the money. And they so they're able to get the money and, and skedaddle. <laughs> In fact, she said this past weekend... Uh, one of the houses that they were leasing, the owner came and there was a family living there. And the, and, and the family said, oh, no, uh, yeah, we just rented it. He said, no, you <laughs> what? No, you didn't. I'm, I'm still wow. showing this. And they had gotten keys. They had gotten in. They had moved in. They were living in the house. Wow. <laughs> so and they, uh, yeah. this is not, I mean, and that's a Craigslist scam. But the point is that these are what would be traditional real life scams just moving to the Internet as everything else is. Mm, be yeah. aware of it. And you'll, and you'll probably see more. Just earlier this month, uh, this guy who was working for a site called Decor My Eyes, his name was Vidaly Borker. Oh, he gave, going yeah. to jail. Yeah. Go directly he just to got jail. Convicted. <laughs> yeah, that must years. have made you happy because he was the guy, we talked a lot about it, who was saying, yeah, when I, when I, uh, when I yell at my customers, it's good for my Google juice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it, I, I'm really happy that that technique <laughs> is probably not going to be more common because you don't want to go to jail for four years. <laughs> well, and it's, and it's true is what happened was he would say horrendous things and people would blog about it and post about it and they put a link to his decor may I site and that raised his ranking, mm-hmm. right? But I think you guys, in fact, we even had you on, I think, at that time. Yeah, right? then, yeah. You, you yeah, talked yeah. about responding. It, it turned out to be this news stories writing about the guy getting sued, that that was how he was getting the links. Right. It wasn't all the complaints that were helping him out. But. Mm. Hmm. Nothing you could do, nothing you could do about that. Hey, Matt, are we going to ever see the... Uh, 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 comeback of the uh, personalized domain blocking for search results? Wow, good question. Um, you can still, there's still a, a console where you can use it. So it's not in the search results, but there's a Chrome extension, so you can use that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's also a console where you can go. So it's it's just, things have to defend their pixels on the search results page, and enough, not enough people use it, then we're more likely to turn that off. Okay, all right. And one other question, we were talking about this either last week or the week before, the Pirate Bay Autocomplete. Is that under you? 
Um, it's it's in search quality, so it's not me specifically that worked on it, but okay. I know some of the guys that. So worked that on is it. the and case that the the, the autocomplete uh, for when you start typing the pirate bay went away. You don't get a. You have to actually type the whole thing and hit enter and hit enter. I um, think that's correct, and and the the theory behind that is with autocomplete with suggest. When you're typing something in, it's it's much more obtrusive to get up in someone's face and say, did you mean this? Is this what you wanted to search for? Right. So if someone wants to search for X, Y, or Z, we return results for X, Y, or Z. But maybe we're a little more careful about what we suggest. So Is that a slippery slope? Face. That's a little difficult because this, wasn't it the, the uh, German, the German first lady? Pres- the ex-president's who, wife. Yeah. yeah. Who said, well, I don't want you to come up with is a prostitute <laughs> when you search for me. But that's but those search results. Those, tell us how autocomplete works. They come from other searches, right? They do. They do. And it's. It must be really great to be a policy or a lawyer person at Google because you are on the bleeding edge of <laughs> these kinds of issues. But uh, we've actually come up with some pretty good policies. I think we're going to try to make those more public soon. You know, basically hate speech, porn. Spam, you know, uh, there's a there's a very small category set of categories where we'll say, okay, this is where we don't want to get up in someone's face and suggest stuff that they don't want to see. But in general, it's it's by looking at people's searches that we help learn. Okay, that people who search for this might also be searching for this. So here's a useful query for you to type in. So I think nobody would complain at all if you had a very clear set of standards. The risk, of course, is, is just as you said, looking at uh, – you want to reflect the truth of the net and not be editorializing about it. So it's a very difficult line to walk. It is, and, and I can imagine you know, a situation in which maybe if there's something already in the web search results – so maybe there's been a newspaper story or something like that. So there's some evidence you know, that this is already a controversy that people are talking about this particular – search, then it might make sense to show that search. So we're always trying to find the right way to split the difference between free expression and trying to give people all the information they need and and still be responsible to. Very tricksy. Very difficult thing to do. Google News, 10 years old? 10 years. Hard to believe. They held a party with a cake. Uh, uh, Because Google itself is only like 12 years old, right? So 14. 14 now. Wow. Wow. Google News was launched September 22nd, 2002. And uh, I've been using it religiously ever since. Yep. During the Online News Association in San Francisco, they uh, they held a party. So uh, Christian Barat, the founder of it, Richard Jingris, is in charge now. We're there, and we had uh, pot stickers and cake in the uh, in the San Francisco office. Wasn't that it? That was dinner. Wasn't it controversial, Jeff, originally that uh, algor- yes. you could algorithmically determine news? It was controversial in a few ways, right? That was one of, oh, my God, what happens to editors? And then controversial, of course, in the other way of saying, this is stealing our soul and oh, yeah. uh, taking a well, picture of us, right? That's still, Interesting news that's that still. just happened today. It's not on the, well, it's not on the rundown. Um, and, and I love this story. Rupert Murdoch, who yeah. called uh, Google uh, parasites and stopped linking to us, pulled uh, the stuff from the Times of London, we purpose paywall from Google, just meek, meekly just came back and now allows Google to put up headlines and snippets because he needs them. Mm-hmm. He needs the eggs. Interesting. Because that was the issue. Is like, yeah, okay, so the snippets are there, but it links to your properties, Rupert. Well, it's not exactly. like... Exactly. So it's a great timing, too, because right now, for Google's sake, right now in Germany, as I think I mentioned, we have a, a high potential of a law called a Leistungsschutzrecht, an ancillary copyright going in, which would require Google and other right. uh, aggregators to pay for snippets and headlines. That, that notion is spreading to France, of course. Crazy. Uh, so in the meantime, right now, Murdoch, the greatest Google hater there was out there, and now comes crawling back with his tail between his legs, which is where it is these days most of the time. It's essentially <laughs> an acknowledgement that we could, we, it cost us. Yeah. Cost us yeah, traffic. Even with a paywall. Even with a <clears throat> paywall. So, so you know, he's, he's still sending people to a wall, so it's not really an advertising strategy, but he needs subscriber acquisition. And, if, and, and, and the Times is completely unseen in the conversation now. You don't even know it comes up that it, mm-hmm. it has anything to contribute to a cluster of news. So he had to be back in there, which is kind of beautiful. Yeah, I like that. I saw that. That was pretty good. And it really is all about eyeballs. I mean, people aren't <laughs> noticing anymore. And when it's not there, people don't notice. Yeah. They don't see it. Yeah. Good luck having them find you. Whether you're making them pay for it or not, if they don't see it, then eventually Here's nobody's going to be paying for it. So You're right, Aaron. And, and, and you can get it back into Google search. But what you're not going to get it back into is Twitter or Facebook or Google Plus. 
because you're, 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 you know, you're not going to – if you send someone to the Wall Street Journal, at least it's a porous paywall. The New York Times is a porous paywall. Uh, New York Times has it set up so that any links will come through to the article. But the, but the Times of London, nothing does. Yeah. So I'm not, yeah, you want to see this? you got to pay. Subscribe. I'm not going to link to it. And, so, and the Wall still, Street Journal too, right? I mean uh, – It's you, not as, as steel as it has some porosity. You see an excerpt, and I guess Google search was, or Google News gets you the full article. Still. An FT, no, 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 they took that out. They I, took I, that I think out. they took that out. But F, the FT, you can get uh, some number of articles a month, like the Times. Now, contrast this. I don't know if you read David Carr's piece uh, about David Bradley, the owner of Atlantic Media in the yeah. New York Times. Really interesting uh, story. Bradley uh, thought <laughs> there'd be money to make in, in magazines. <laughs> <laughs> So dollars <laughs> later, <laughs> he he, uh, he bought um, the the Atlantic, and um, he says it was expensive and painful. I clearly did not know what I was getting into. Um, he really? wanted to buy Newsweek, couldn't get it, so he bought the Atlantic in 1998 along with the National Journal and Government Executive magazine. So fast forward uh, to 14 years later, and he's doing basically a uh, web business, right? doing great. Uh, he hired, a, I think, the most brilliant business side guy in magazines in the U.S. named Justin Smith, who was responsible for the launch of the week. And Justin's been on a, on a high-end digital first view where he's pushed Atlantic Online, made really Atlantic You can Wire, read the entire magazine uh, online. It's great stuff. That They just started, uh, well, they just started this week, Courts, which is a new uh, QZ.com, which is a new uh, financial news service for the high also end. Also free. He very, very good. Uh, just the beginning of it, but really, really good. And there's a great quote toward the end of that article, Leo, where uh, Bradley says that digital trumps print and, uh, you know, 100% digital trumps print. And, and I think it's a really important way, which, again, goes against the religion of the Murdochs of the world who want to hold on, or the Columbia Journalism Review, who want to hold on to the old models. And Justin Smith, with Bradley's backing, uh, created a new model in the Atlantic, and now they're expanding it with courts, and I, I imagine they will in other areas. Now, what they do is they go to very high-end advertising. They, he sells Court, high-end advertising. Courts high has Boeing, Cadillac, Chevron, and Credit Suisse, and they've bought it out through the end of the year, by the way. They also create a scarcity that way. We have a high-end audience. We have only so much. Very so it's, important. It's a, it's, and it's really good to see digital winning. It's, good. it's not just good for my, you know, nia, nia, nia points. It's good because it's the future of media, and it's good to see some success stories. Well, and they've been profitable three years running. That's the key. They were losing money hand over fist, and they are now profitable mm -hmm. by giving it away free ad-supported media. I think this is – when I read this article, I, I couldn't wait to bring it up with you, Jeff, because it's just – it's such good news. It is. It really is. Yeah. And it's, it's a good David Carr column. Very good one. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, yeah, maybe Rupert should read this. <laughs> I haven't looked at Quartz yet. Is it good? It's very good. Uh, QZ.com, if you want to take a quick look at it. Uh, it's, it's a great you know, it's, URL. It's, How do you get that, huh? Wow. Uh, what that's from uh, some... You know, QTZ? QTZ. You know, QZ, two letters. QZ. Oh, there it is. Very simple looking. Well, it's it's straightforward blog with good uh, coding across. The part, part of what the editors have said is they don't have beats. They have obsessions. Yeah. So if been going on right now they'll dig in can, it, I, can I just point cool. out this is our model and uh this is what we've learned about, yep. that works on uh, in ad supported media do your passion do your obsession yep. that's what people want to read they want to read somebody who's like so involved in this that they they know everything right and they're wonks they hired some of the best and brightest young folks yeah uh, yeah interesting Zach seward and others yeah nate silver interview uh former head of um uh, digital at The Economist. Very interesting stuff. All right. Moving on. Let's see what's next. Let's take a break and then come back with a, a little bit more. Have you seen Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn around the campus, by the way, Matt? Uh, I can neither confirm nor <laughs> deny that I've seen <laughs> Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn what? around the campus. Are you signed to an NDA or something? You know, it was funny. I... Uh, I did apply to be an extra, but yeah, because I thought that would be funny no for all kidding. the SEOs. But uh, <laughs> my parents were visiting, and so I wasn't able to do much time. And, and so they were like, yeah, we don't really need you. Thank you. <laughs> oh. They're making a That's movie fine. called The Internship, and they got permission. We talked about this last week, permission to use the Google campus as the set, which I think is fantastic. It makes me want to see the movie. I can tell you that right yeah, now. Yeah, absolutely. It's about what? It's about uh, two, two grown guys who get an internship. 
Yeah, and I guess Google is kind of a very youthful place, and so how do they fit in, you know, fish yeah. out of water sort of story. So it's at Google? It's not like some, uh, you know, fake internet company? It's Google? Well, they, they made up Georgia Tech to look like Google for most of their scenes, but then they did use the courtyard and some of the outdoor areas of Google for just a few days of filming, I think. And I guess Vince Vaughn, Eric Schmidt interviewed Vince Vaughn at an employee talk, <laughs> and uh, Hugo Barra, among others, have been extras. You can see in the bus picture, they splashed a huge Google logo on that bus oh, that's uh, in that picture, and, and it's... It's pretty fun to look at something that's even more googly, like they add more Google logos than we have. <laughs> <laughs> more Google. That's hysterical. And they're all wearing 49ers hats, it looks like. They're at a 49ers game. That's awesome. Uh, oops. So let's, uh, let's uh, I want to also show the picture of Sergey, as long as we're, as long as we're star. Um, Going after the star power. Star power. <laughs> <laughs> Sergey at the signing of the automo of the autonomous vehicle bill in California. Let me see if I can find this. It was Sergey Brin and Jerry Brown. So maybe if I Google Sergey Brin and Jerry Brown, and and Matt, if you could flip the switch that makes that search result come up with exactly what I want. Oh, he flip did. Look at that. There we wow. Go. <laughs> can you tell me so that that's not the weirdest? looking thing you've ever seen i don't know oh, which jerry brown or no yeah, that's what i was wondering <laughs> jerry brown looks like a governor what is i uh, uh, you know I, I think it was smart of of the guys to do the new york fashion week because i'd much rather see pictures <laughs> of yes. the google glass on really attractive people than a slub like me or something like that but I don't know if this is selling it, frankly. I don't know if this is selling it. Look at Jerry. <laughs> Are people going to walk around? Sergey looks <laughs> demented. Well, I, I think as long as it's compelling enough as far as the functionality, people, you know, like you'll start with the geeks and other people. But, looks, uh, he looks like Lockatus. <laughs> so I, the, now, if it had been Arnold Schwarzenegger, when Arnold Schwarzenegger was governor... Then it would just be okay, you know. Right. Yeah, <laughs> fits right in. Fits right in. We got Terminator and Lockitus, but uh, it's just. I also it's just... like the, the I like the Ilya Kuryakin uh, outfit. A yes. reference most of your audience will not get. He's wearing a T-shirt, a collarless shirt. He does look like Ilya it's Kuryakin. Like a spy, yeah. yeah. I guess when you're when you're Sergey, you can pretty much do whatever you want. You know, like we'll make jokes that he's like. You know, Batman, billionaire, industrialist, builds cool <laughs> gadgets, all that sort of stuff. He is this. It, yeah, exactly. It's Stark. Stark Enterprises. Yeah, so um, I, you can you cannot answer this if you don't want. It's by Locutus. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me. And it, it would be pronounced Locutus of Borg. If not, you mispronounced that. I don't think that's the correct pronunciation <laughs> for Locutus. <laughs> Perhaps you didn't see episode 48 when they. Um, and you can you can recuse yourself on this one. But we are seeing a lot of Sergey, but we're not seeing much of Larry. What's going on with Larry? Uh, he's doing well. He's he's actively back at CEO. He's got his voice back. He's talking. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh good. Yeah. So he's you know he's still you know at the reins of the company doing doing CEO stuff. Oh that's good and doing yeah. it apparently well. But we'll get to that later. In yeah. He's doing a great job. I just that's what. I, but we last we'd heard he'd lost his voice. He was still running the company with his voiceless. So I'm glad to hear his voice is back. That's good. Yeah, All and right. the funny thing about that story is, I looked out in the courtyard and I saw a self-driving car parked. I was like, "That's weird. They're normally moving around." It turns out it was because they'd parked them for the signing ceremony. So. Uh, that's pretty I cool. I saw my first uh, uh, self-driving SUV when I went to the Google campus. Wow! I yeah, they got those. You... They got those Lexuses, right? They're, yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw Jeff tweet it, and then I was like, "Oh, Jeff must be in the area." But then I missed you, so you know. Oh, sorry. It's all good. I was it's talking to the Google Plus people. Do you have a Google yeah. Glass? Do you ever wear yours? So the problem is with my current glasses, you yeah. know, it would make it a little bit more tricky. I, I certainly would love to play with them, but, uh, you know, it might take a little while longer to, to handle see. it if the you're a geeky guy with glasses. Yeah. Mm. I'm 58 years old. It'll probably make me go get contacts for the first time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. There you go. I'm wondering I, if, uh, I'm, if, by the way... <laughs> They say the irony of me making fun of nerds is just out of control. <laughs> <laughs> you are king nerds, Big sire. Ginge said the irony fairy just passed out. <laughs> uh, it's pronounced lacutus, Leo, lacutus of Borg. Perhaps you didn't know. <laughs> are they, how long before Google says that when you show up in public, Matt, you have to wear a glass? <laughs> 
I, you know, if they would give it to me, I would put it on right now. I All would right. take okay. it on over the glasses. He's and not everything. resisting. No, I'm, no, no. And and I wouldn't work my life. I'm number seven forty seven, and <laughs> and I would gladly I will wear them on the show on the show. <laughs> Just send them along. People would love to watch for, through <laughs> your eyes as you yeah, do. Yeah, I wonder the, if you can show. hook that into the awesome. uh, hook that into the system. And I am Leo Cutis. We're switch over of to Borg. <laughs> switch to Leo's glasses now. <laughs> <laughs> the Leo cam. Leo cutis. <laughs> that, am I saying that right now? I don't watch that show. What is that show? Star Trek? Never heard of it. <laughs> uh, maybe I better not do an ad right now. I guess I won't point bad. out my t-shirt. <laughs> bad thing. What are you What does that say? Darmox and Jalad at t uh, Is that Star Wars this stuff? This is a geek test. Yeah, this is Star Wars. There was an episode of Star Wars where they were trapped on the planet, him and this alien. The universal translator wasn't working. They had to communicate by metaphor. At Tanagra. Am At I Tanagra. saying that right? Or is That's it right. You got Tanagra. It. Hey, you pronounced it correctly. So, <laughs> Darmok and Gilad at Tanagra. They can't, they can't pounce on you for that. <laughs> <laughs> wow! See, if you had the glasses, you could Google that with him and not knowing. I could. That you were searching for it. So See, that's, that's right. What I need there you that go. For. Yeah, yeah. Because if frankly, for... I would, ne I would have no idea. So really, you'd have to be a real nerd to know what that was. <laughs> yep, I'm raising my hand now. That's me. I'm a real nerd. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> real nerd. <laughs> would you have got that one, Matt? Uh, with the help of Google, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> I need you were that. over my head. Although I have to say, I'm wearing my novelty T-shirt. Let's see. Oh, it's re it's re it's re re uh, redacted. Oh, that's a good one. Blank, it's blank, blank sofa. sofa. Nice. And all I got was this stupid T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I do like that. I like it. I do like that. That's great. Is that from TNG? Or, no, it's from Star Wars. No, this is from TNG. Ah. Oh. Yep. TNG. There's why, because I missed that whole series, that whole season. That's whatever. Yep. It was gone. Google responded. You know, this was this was a very sloppy, I think, article in the New York Times about da the cost of data centers, yep. um, in which they uh, kind of accused the Internet of being the problem and then talked about a bunch of privately run data centers like Nexus Nexus from the like the 18th century. Right. Um, and and uh, I think, in fact, a lot of people have responded to this article has been pretty much roundly excoriated. My favorite was a tweet from Chris Saka, who's a former Googler, who said, actually, Google's efficiency is approaching the theoretical limits. Yeah. Uh, more so, though. It we is we not, do care about efficiency. It is not a bad point to make that the co electrical cost of using the Internet doesn't stop with your personal power bill. That when you go out on the net and you're using servers, those servers are plugged in, too. So that's appropriate, I think, to let people know that. But the good news is just as centralizing uh, power production in power plants makes them more efficient, um, these, these, with companies like Facebook and Google, where this is a, an Apple, too, where it's a huge part of their cost, they pay a lot of attention to making these as efficient as possible. And buying mm -hmm. wind power and, and spending a fortune on alternative power and trying to figure that out. And, and there's never a legitimate comparison to the old world ways and, and how, you know, not driving to the library to get the book that was right. over there by a truck. It, it, That's a good better. point. It's, it's a classic New York Times kind of trend effort for a trend story. There's a great, I recommend this highly. There's a, a, a great Twitter account called NYT on it. I love it. It makes fun of all of the trend stories. So this one was, it always starts this way. Guys, apparently it takes a lot of energy to power the internets and the Times is on it. <laughs> <laughs> the earlier one, I love this. Guys, turns out not drinking soda is much better for you than drinking soda. And the Times <laughs> is on it. That's funny. <laughs> Guys, some New Yorkers live in really small apartments, and the time is on. I'll stop now. It is a very, it is very, very funny. It is. <laughs> uh, it's almost as good as that horse account. What is the name of that one? That is so funny. Uh, yeah. Uh, e book horse ebooks. You've seen that one, right? I haven't seen that one. This is a no. spam account, I think. I kind of feel like it is. Yeah. Is it horse no. underscore ebooks? Is that what it is? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. So it's unclear what's going on here. But it's the funniest kind of non sequitur. And, and you see they have 110,000 followers <laughs> because you just read their tweets and, and like, here's one. You that you could be destroying and preventing these pests from your beautiful organic garden within hours after. Or 
What can you do about it? But see, every once in a while, there's a link. See, that's why I think it's a spammer. Mm, yeah. Vegetables are tender, turning. In 1992, I innovated. Or Lingo. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then every once in a while, there's a little link. So I, I can only think that there's something going on here. I'm sure it's yeah. the exact same number, interval number, right? Yeah, sticker, 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 sticker. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Yay, yay. Registration, yes, yay. And sticker. <laughs> Why are people following this, though? Because it's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> How about this one? My husband was fed up with our cat peeing on his clothes, only his, and we had tried. This is the, to have to do this with Matt Cutts in the room is like <laughs> lionizing a criminal in a convention of cops. Oh, you oh. Know? and then they have earn on ClickBank ebooks, and it yeah, looks like some affiliate yeah, kind of. Oh. Yeah. I'm sure that's what it is. <laughs> I never really understood the, I, the even the concept of spam in a, in an ecosystem like Twitter, where you actively have to follow somebody, but. It works somehow. Yeah, here it is. Earn on ClickBank eBooks. So that's the spam right there. Hidden, buried deep within mm. things like sweet recipes and become a bale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, enough of that. Now I can talk about stamps.com. I have, I have sanitized the stream <laughs> from my nerdiness. Stamps.com. Actually, this is a little nerdy. Uh, it's on-demand postage. I mean, okay, and the reason that Stamps.com loves doing ads on the Twit Network is because they know you guys get it. You don't want to go to the post office. You have a computer. You have a printer. Wouldn't it be cool if you could use your computer printer to print postage? Now, you can't print U.S. money yet, but you can print official U.S. postage. It's kind of cool with Stamps.com. If you, it, you can try it. I'll have to give you a, a no-risk trial offer in just a second. There are many advantages to doing this. For one thing, uh, it's on-demand postage. You wake up in the middle of the night and you, you want to mail something, you can. On-demand. But it's also a great way to save. You get discounts you can't get at the post office, 21% or more even on express mail, priority mail up to 15%. Uh, they get a, a, a international mail. They've got discounts. You can't get those at the post office. You can mail stuff via stamps.com that you have to go to the post office to mail normally be the post office uh, uh, you know anything over 13 ounces you can't throw in a mailbox if you could find one they took all our mailboxes out have you there's no more mail have you can you know where there's no more mailboxes at Petaluma I found one and you know where they put it where next to the next to the post office well no next to the city hall because oh. all the people at city hall don't want to like they were like well we're taking them okay. all out of the city except for ours there are That's no so mailboxes mail that's so they can mail their parking tickets because I got one for $48. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Sorry. Sorry about that. When you were here, it, you got a $48 a, ticket? All in a good cause, Leo. All send, it, send it to us. We'll, no, we'll take no, care no, of it. No. We'll be glad to take care of it. You know, you don't even have to do that. Just uh, tweet, the, <laughs> tweet the ticket uh, serial number and I'll pay it. <laughs> no, no. Seriously. Kickstarter. I'll, yeah. Kickstarter. Kickstarter. We'll do a little what Kickstarter. What really part. saying is he has pull at City Hall. No, him. I have no pull. I have no pull at City. If I did, I'd have a mailbox. But no, I have stamps.com <laughs> instead. The beauty of this is they come and get it. You don't need a mailbox. They come and get it. Uh, no matter what size the package is, you also get a great USB scale as part of the offer for free so that you can, uh, it's up to 25 pounds, plop your letter or you never have to put, do you ever put more stamps on a package just so you, you know, because you don't know what it weighs and you hope, it's, you hope it gets there? You're throwing money away. You'll never do that again with stamps.com. Plus, it looks cool. You can have it print your logo, whatever, any image you want uh, for the stamp. In fact, it'll print the whole envelope out. It takes the addresses from QuickBooks. Uh, if you're an eBay, Amazon, or Etsy seller, it'll take the data from those pages when you have to mail the product. It's great if you're an Etsy. This You have to have a stamps account. So go to stamps.com right now. Now, let me show you the deal here. If You, you see there in the upper right-hand corner, don't take the $80 deal. That's not good enough for you. No, no, no. Upper right-hand corner, click that microphone or where it says click here. And then enter TWIG, T-W-I-G, and click go. And that $80 offer is now a $110 bonus offer, $55 of free postage. The digital scale is yours. You pay shipping and handling, which I think is 5 bucks. It's a $50 scale. Um, they'll give you a $5 supply kit to kind of make up for that and a four-week trial free. And if you can cancel at any time, you don't have to pay a thing, but you can keep the scale forever. I think you're going to want to stick with it. Stamps.com. It's, it's the post office comes to you. It's fantastic. Stamps.com. What are you doing going to the post office? Now, that's wasteful. That's wasting energy. You're worried about the Google network centers. This is waste. Driving to the post office, that's wasteful. 
Google Play, I just saw this a stat this morning, uh, 25 billion downloads. Is that your number? I hope not, Jeff. It's okay. I got another one. Um, <laughs> I, I, I took Aaron's uh, sorry. Um, tip earlier, but, but, but did it quickly. I talked so fast, nobody will remember it. Uh, yeah, so they're offering uh, a bunch of 25-cent apps right now as a promotion. Oh, cool. Awesome. I should the go numbers up. now are so big. It, it, it kind of twenty five billion, fifty billion. billion. Wow. that's amazing. Yeah, and I think there are six. It says six hundred seventy five thousand apps. They're getting very close to iOS, which I think is seven fifty. You know, <laughs> once you At get this point, after a few hundred thousand, it, the, the difference makes no difference. All I was missing, as far as I was concerned, what I use on on my my beloved uh, Nexus Seven was HBO to go and Showtime to go. I now have HBO to go. I'm waiting for Showtime. Then, then I'm good. I got it. Hey, as long as we're talking about that, this is the Kindle Fire HD. Same size as the Next 7. It's a little cheaper if you compare RAM. It's a, it's 200 bucks for the 16 gig version, and they have a 32 gig. Although nowadays, RAM, I'm not RAM, storage doesn't seem that important because, frankly, almost everything you're doing mm. on here is streaming. Um, and it is Android, but you'd never know that. I'll tell you, it's that it's that weird uh, Amazon uh, interface, which I've now somehow done something with, and I'm I'm lost. Oh, there we go. There's the New York Times. You know, it's fine. Um, the it, the whole equation is changed by the Nexus Seven because the Nexus Seven yeah. uh, is is roughly the same price and, and so much better. And it's yeah. it's Jelly Bean, and it's and it's un you know. How about the Nook? Is the Nook also DM? Now they just now announced their new Nook, which is right. definitely a competitor. Uh, to the Kindle Fire mm -hmm. HD, and it also has the it, it's highly tailored for uh, Barnes and Noble. I mean, they're but they're starting up some new is, businesses. Is it as it is as de googled as as yes. uh, oh, yeah. it is? Yes, oh, yeah. yes, absolutely. Because they're doing the same thing that that um, Amazon's trying to do. Right, they're trying to drive you know business. So they're starting up new magazine business and video business to right. to try to you know get people to you you know to to drive business back to them. Um, so, you know, it's, but I think people will like it. I mean, it's, it looks like technology wise, it looks like a very good competitor to the Kindle tablet. So and they anybody have, who's watching this show would be buying a Nexus seven and wouldn't uh, even would hope so. you say, Leo, right. Yeah. You, Cause you, I, I, I use it as my Kindle. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, but I, but I get so much more. My mom is addicted. I got her one just right after a Google IO, a Nexus seven. And she's like, I will not use a tablet. I will not use a tablet. I don't right. like these things. And so I, so I said, ah, you know what? I'm going to give her one. If she doesn't like it, she can send it to me because I'll definitely use it. So <laughs> I gave her one and she is hooked. She keeps telling me, I'm so glad you, I take it everywhere. I use it. I play this silly ball game. I love it. So, you know, she's, she's hooked. She's 70 years old and she loves it. So, uh, oops, funny. I shouldn't have said her age. Uh, my mom's You're turning in 80 in January, but she's an iPad user. I just sent her the new mm. iPad 3. Mm -hmm. um, the browser, somebody asked me how about the browser. It's not as, you know, it's like not as quite Chrome. It's the Silk browser supposedly is caching and is faster. I don't see that at all. Let's hope load, <laughs> load in Oktoberfest feasts. You know, I mean, I guess it's pretty fast. It's. You know, uh, I I can't see any reason to get this unless you're so hooked into the Amazon ecosystem. And I bet you it's the same thing for the Nook. If you're so hooked into the Barnes & Noble ecosystem mm -hmm. that you really want to just live there, you know. Um, I've been meaning to read the privacy policy because I wonder if, if, if you went and just looked at um, an article about Oktoberfest, are you going to see I mean, recipes? Are you going to see a cookbook uh, in your recommendation soon? That will be interesting. Well, I'll let you know because that's what I just did. I looked at an uh, Oktoberfest recipe. Um, you, you do get offers. You can pay to get the offers off, but it's not a big deal. You saw an no. offer when I launched. It's not a big deal. Um, it, it's, but the point is the Nexus 7 is all that and more. Um, yes. So I just don't see any compelling reason since you can get the – There's a, okay, I'll give you one reason. There's one thing you can do on this, and it's very, you know, it's very uh, nerdy. If you're reading a book that you have the equivalent audio book for, so this is an Agatha Christie book that Amazon was offering for free. When the audio book, when it sees, it puts the audio here, I could press play, and it will narrate the audio book and highlight the text mm. as it's reading. I have to turn, I turned it down. I turn it up. So as it's reading, it highlights the text that it's reading. I don't know of any other device that you can do that on. I mean, that's, I don't know. Also, no, this would be good, I guess, for a kid who's learning to read or maybe a dyslexic or something, but... Um, it does have that every, but every audible has the whisper sync thing. Um, and if you're reading a book, it will automatically jump you to that part uh, of the audio book. So you can listen on, uh, from there. 
Um, X-ray, that was a unique thing. So uh, <laughs> this is wild, actually. I didn't, I've never done this before. So there's four characters mentioned on that page, mm. and I can see all the places they show up in the book. Now, that's kind of wild. That is kind of wild. The digital humanists will go down. I mean, digital, uh, what do they call it? Digital humanism, digital whatever. Yeah, here's all the about. references to Mrs. Cavendish. Would that be good in a text, wow. like a like a, uh, a text? Uh, Maybe. You know, for, for college no, and stuff? it'd be good for okay. porn. Oh. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. Let's see. Here's all the places where pony play occurred. Okay. I. Wow. That's, uh, here's the good parts. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, get the Nexus 7. Yeah. Get the Nexus 7. There's just no question about it. Unless you're watching audio porn <laughs> or something. The x-ray is kind of interesting. You're, it's a little distracting. You're watching a movie and it says, here's who's in the movie. And you tap it and you stop the movie and you could read their bio. Mm. It's kind. Of, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, why don't they link that to... Have they linked it to products yet? IMDb. Well, maybe I'm... When I'll, you're watching a video, if they, they yes. zoom in on somebody's yes. shoes, as you as click the fact, shoes and it... As a matter of fact, I think that you know, that does happen. That's one of those happen. great holy grails that everyone talks about and that never arrives. Uh, think, well, if anybody's going to do it, it's going to be Amazon. Yeah, they're best that's positioned. That's true. Yep. Yeah. The let me, Zappo Slayer. Let me, let me see if this is... I was watching a movie. Now, it's probably... Exp has it expired? Oh, yeah, because it's instant. So I'm instant prime. Now I have to buy it. I don't want to rent the Avengers. I was watching a movie and uh, pick up where you left off. Okay. Where did I leave off? Oh, I wasn't watching that. Huh. I don't know where it's, where it's getting these movies, but it thinks I like Red Shoe Diaries. I, I, I don't, judging, oh. from the, judging from the cover, uh, I think I might, oh, actually. Busted. No, I never, I don't know what, the, whoa, no, stop. I pressed, I tapped it by accident. The chat room says Soft 50 Shades of Grey. It's $20.99. Hmm. Okay, uh, let me find something so I can, here, Super 8 is on uh, free. So if I watch it, it will pop up. I'll just show you. It's a long way to go to show you this silly thing. But it, as you watch the credits, you see there's the x-ray. See full cast. Okay. You, mm. can, you hit it, and then you're going to get an IMDb mm. thing. I think that's – I mean, it kind of reflects how people – I often do that. I'll, I'll say, oh, who was that? What yeah. was he in? Especially since you have your devices in your living room now. Right. I, a lot of times I'm watching a movie, I'll pause it. And then bring up my tablet or my my laptop and and type in you know IMDb or right. you know oh I remember that person what else was she in you know so this person's on screen so it's showing his his bio um, oh group shot so what whatever happened to that kid did he ever have a career or was that it that kind of thing I don't know I think that I think this is it. and you're right I think the future of this yeah. and I'm sure Amazon's prepping for it is oh I'd like to buy that T-shirt right. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't that be cool? That would be actually. I wouldn't mind that. No. No. Not if it's there a choice. As long as Star Trek and hear a character's name referenced and he'll get a t shirt <laughs> off of him. <yeah. laughs> oh man. They just mentioned Tarmac and Talad. <laughs> I I Valad. Jalad. I've got to go to Ragnarok and get the special T shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's my dream to do that with Twit. It would be really good if the little things could pop up in the corner. I wouldn't have to sell so much. Go buy a Mustang. Click. Yeah. <laughs> Save me a lot of time. Yep. A lot of trouble. Uh, speaking of time and trouble, we better wrap this thing up. There's so many stories. Okay, I get each oh, of you. Could, stuff each of you could pick a pick a story that you think we ought to be talking about. Uh, there was a big Samsung TouchWiz vulnerability, which they have patched. It was. <laughs> Pretty stupid <laughs> vulnerability. Yeah. Apparently, they uh, there's a code you could enter into the dialer that would erase the phone, everything, a hard reset, all your data. And then there was a further code that would erase all the data on the SIM card. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, just open. All you had to do was enter it. And then, then it turns out that you could do that with an NFC chip. You could do that with a text message. You could do that with a malicious website. And you just go to the site and boom, your, your device is reset. Yep. Uh, so if you have a Samsung Galaxy S2 or S3 and there's a and, and Samsung offers you an over-the-air download today, take it because uh, they have patched it. Uh, and I was just checking because I'm running CM10 on my Galaxy S3 and CM10 is not vulnerable. Yeah, I think Jelly Bean or uh, maybe if it's even Ice Cream Sandwich and Up was okay. At least Jelly Bean, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, jelly Bean I, and I Up to, is fine. That's why I did CM10 because yep. I wanted Jelly Bean. Yep. Boy, I really love Jelly Bean. Yep. If you use the stock Android, you're safe. 
Yes. It's just it's the touch it was, whiz. It was it's just it the was touch, touch whiz. whiz. Yep. Which should be spelled differently. Uh, <laughs> Dick, did you see Dick uh, Costello of uh, Twitter talking yes, at ONA? I and I jumped up to ask him a question. Uh, he spoke at the Online News Association. He's been on a PR role. He did Charlie Rose. He just did, I think, CNBC. Uh, he's done some others. So Emily Bell, a uh, brilliant uh, journalist from the ex from the Guardian, now at Columbia, uh, my friendly competitor, uh, interviewed him and did an excellent job. She started off asking him, well, how, how, is it, how is it, Dick, to be in charge of the free speech of the modern world? Um, <laughs> Great question. It, it, it was. Uh, he got a lot of stuff about the platform. His, his argument, which I uh, you know, don't fully understand, but he was arguing that uh, what their aim is is to uh, enable people to accrete value. That, that you know, Amazon opened up its platform. It enabled other stores to come in to sell goods at lower prices than Amazon, but they accrete value to the customer and to the partner and to Amazon itself in that process, and he wants the same thing. But he, but he keeps on talking about developing into Amazon, not on top of Amazon. Into Twitter not, or into Twitter? Into Twitter. Into <laughs> that would Twitter. have been something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, a little commerce partner, um, if you blog about shoes. So, so developing into Twitter, and I, I don't know what that fully means. And I, push them. I, I got up and, and, and asked about the, um, you know, the communications, and then I uh, ended up and said, are there any more shoes to drop? <laughs> and uh, he said no. That was the headline. No more shoes to drop. So if this, then that, Jeff? Uh, it sounds like he they turned argued, that good, off. Great, great question, Matt. He somebody asked about that. Well, he said he said it had nothing to do with them and their platform. This is stories that come out. We should explain um, that they, they they were cut off from Twitter access. If this and that's a great website that lets you say, hey, if I if I see a tweet with this hashtag, then email it to me or do some other action. They no longer have that access. Here, here's well, here's the problem that that uh, so Dick said on the stage. Well, no, that, that people are saying that's the uh, the API it has nothing to do with the API. And then he changed the subject. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, I was talking to the good folks from Storify. Uh, and they said, well, no, the, the reason if this and that went was because they were storing and forwarding tweets. And you're not allowed to do that, which also could affect a place like Storify, though Twitter has said they love Storify. So mm -hmm. there are shoes dangling, I would say, Matt, still. Okay. <laughs> yeah. He also says yeah. there's, he's, got, he's, got a, he's got a replacement in mind for the follower count. That's kind of that a was, clout score. No, I think it was Ev. Oh, Ev said, said that. that. That's right. Yeah, Ev, Ev, Ev wanted, uh, he says retweets are more important than followers. Mm. I think that's, that's kind of true. But how many people see the retweet is your follower count? Well, that's, that's what Ev said. And mind you, this was, Ev was being impish. I saw Ev, too, at, at, at Medium and, and some really interesting thinking that he's doing, of course. And uh, so I tried to talk a little bit about Twitter, and he just kind of you know, shrugs. And so he did an appearance in New York this week at, uh, with BuzzFeed and, and Branch. And I think he was being impish about saying, well, I shouldn't say things because I'm on the board, but... <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he made that mention of retweet being probably a more important metric and said that the real goal, and this is, this is, this is I think, very impish, because I've asked about this before. The real goal is to get a number of the tweets that are actually seen. You know, I, there's there's a huge uh, impression, I, actual impressions, actual impressions of tweets, right? So I, I my my follower list got so big, and I'm not going to groom it, and so it's a mess. So I use my media wonks list mainly. I read that every tweet on that, but I don't read every tweet of everybody I follow. Most don't. So there's a huge volume of tweets that are never seen by a human eye. And for Ev to say that, that's kind of a little weak underbelly of Twitter there, I thought, which was interesting, but I think it's very honest. Mm -hmm. That if Twitter is going to argue that they have this value, they're going to have to get honest about that valuation. Because if they are a media company, and note they may hire a Hollywood guy mm -hmm. to be on their board, Peter Chernin, X News Corp. If they, and, and, and Costello said, no, 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 we're a technology company that is in the media business. We're not a media company. Mm -hmm. They're a media company. And if they're a media company, they're going to have to do things like measure accurately, and they're going to get audited for those things. So they better get their act together because that's what media companies have to do too. Real quickly, Marissa Meyer revealed – no, she didn't. Not really. <laughs> she said she was going to, but she didn't. Radical transparency, but she didn't say what she was going to do um, <laughs> to an all-hands meeting. She called it an act of radical transparency. Kara Swisher pointed out so they didn't say no such thing. Anybody Kara, else bullish? Kara, huh? Is anybody else bullish on Yahoo? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely 
I'm bullish on Marissa because yeah, exactly. she worked so hard. And if you look at the stuff she's done already, you know, uh, being able to sell some of the assets in Asia, you know, free food for the employees, letting the employees get phones that aren't Blackberries. Like she's she's taking really good steps to get goodwill, which then she mm-hmm. can parlay that into people doing good work. So, yep, yep. And yet, <laughs> she has to come up with a strategy. <laughs> it's all it's all well and good to give people food. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think we do see the, the glimmers of it. I think, I think that what, she, and, I, and maybe this is just me projecting on what my thoughts are on her, but, but she understands excellent services, great experiences, and she understands data about people and acting on that data about people. And I think that I saw glimmers of that in what, in what leaked out from, from the session, that she's going to improve email and she's going to, uh, she's going to clean it up and do other things. But that, that I think services that yield data about people that she can act upon, I still think is probably where she heads. All Maybe right, that's I, unless you guys have another story that you you, you got to cover. Story real quick is the uh, meeting your troll story. I thought that was interesting. What is that? Uh, a guy was being horribly, horribly, horribly trolled. He left Twitter. Uh, he was getting not just things online, but he, he and his wife were getting horrible things. That's to not work. trolling. That oh. is. Stalking. Because, mm-hmm. That is abuse. Right. Harassment. Yeah. Absolutely. Harassment. He got a friend who, who was better at technology to try to track down and found out that even the foreign domains tracked back to a friend's house. <gasps> and it of course clearly it is. disturbed teenage kid who was doing this. And so he met the kid. And, you know, the kid, one hopes, learned a lot of lessons and is going to get a lot of help. And um, so, but it's, a, it's an interesting way that we talk so much about trolls and faceless trolls and to get behind the story of one that went overboard but then ends somewhere where you know where the ending is. I think it's kind of fascinating to people. So I'd recommend that. On yeah, the it's good. It's at Trainer's Eye. The, he, this is the guy, Leo Trainer. Uh, T R A Y N O R S E Y E dot com. If you want to read about meeting his troll, and he's back on Twitter. Has a happy ending. I don't know if any of you guys had any other stories you wanted to hit. Anything? The one where the nope. the artist put the Google Maps people up on. I the love that. Location. That was kind of cute. <laughs> I bookmarked that because I thought that was so neat. Uh, it's, I think, a German or a Dutch, maybe a Belgian, maybe a Flemish, I don't know, uh, artist who uh, noted that, uh, as as we noted when we had our uh, street view done here at the Brickhouse Studio, that Google requires uh, people be uh, blurred uh, so you don't see their faces. And then he noticed that some people were actually glitched. Of course, that happens with Street View because there's a car driving by. So he decided to make life-size cutouts. Paolo Sirio, I guess he's Italian, made life-size cutouts of people who were glitched in Street View and put them where they were when they were glitched. So this is the Street View picture on the right. On the left, it's it's actually a cutout with a blurred face and everything uh, on the actual spot in London where that picture was taken. Here's one in Berlin. I love it. This is just so whimsical. Another one in that's, London. That's right there. Yeah. There's New York. So there's so there on the right is the Street View picture. On the left is the actual spot where he made the cutout and put. Uh, this is my favorite one. Some construction worker sitting on a stool <laughs> in uh, New York on Houston Street. And there he is. I'm sorry. That's pronounced Locutus Street. And there he is. <laughs> and there he is right there. Isn't that great? Am I right? I love that the glitches and the blurs are are in there. I think that's hilarious. Yeah, he includes the whole thing. Yeah. 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 It's really funny. It's just, it's that's art. Right there. That's art. That's art. Watch out, Banksy. <laughs> yeah, this guy. So, uh, Matt Cuts, I got, a, I got an 18-year-old boy. Just turned 18 in August. I think he should vote. Don't you? I really do. And in fact, my tip for this week is uh, is internetvotes.org. Uh, you know, I'm wearing my SOPA shirt partially because I feel like if the internet is a great constituency, then politicians ought to be paying attention to the internet and all of us on the internet. And so Internet Votes is basically a get out the vote campaign for people on the internet. It lets you do uh, banner ads and widgets on your site and you can even get viral stuff going with Facebook. So you can sort of ping and remind your friends to vote as well. We need to get a lot of people who are net savvy, you know, elected. And this is a really great way to do it. So this is a site by some of the people who had helped with the SOPA protest stuff like Fight for the Future. This is great. So if you have an 18-year-old or an, an even worse, somebody larger who has not registered, he said, I don't know how. I said, I think you can figure it. Go to the post office. <laughs> go to Google and ask. <laughs> or maybe go to Google. And um, some places like California, you can do online. So it's, I'm going to 
So if if I have this here, he could just enter his email address, his uh, his zip code, press the register to vote thing, fill it all out here, and it will do it for him. I'm gonna I'm gonna let me just like it on Facebook right now, so that at least I'll have it on my oh. Facebook, and then I can say, Hey Henry, if you f <laughs> just follow me on Facebook. Do you? That's that is Matt Cutts' uh, tip of the week, Matt. We want to thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate yeah, it's it. Been too long, Matt. It's great to have you back. Love having you here, and it's so brave. Thanks of you. so much. And also, <laughs> and also, his tip is to turn on two step. Do the two step, please. Don't get your account hijacked. I've got two spam emails from friends, oh. and and if they just turned on two factor authentication, they wouldn't have to deal with the humiliation, the embarrassment, the stress, the loss. It's a little bit of hassle, and it'll get easier over time, but it'll it'll keep your account safer. The Think only it. thing that bugs me, I use Google Authenticator. And that's what you use for two-step. You can, or you yep. can have... Uh, actually, you know what's really nice? And that's I, what, I did this, too. You could print out authentication codes. You could just keep them in your wallet. So if you lose your phone, you're not gold. out of luck. Yep. But, but I, I, when I moved my authenticator to the iPhone 5, because I have to test it for a while, I had to start over again. Which, mm, yeah. So they're, they're working on making it easier to sign up. So, you know, ideally it would be like 30 seconds right. instead of like... It'd be nice know, if I could just have more than one authenticator, but I guess that's... That, you can you can. So at one point in the process, there's a QR code that you take a picture of. Yeah. And that's basically a secret that seeds the algorithm. Oh, so I could use two phones code. to take the picture. Yes. Just leave <sighs> the QR code up and take pictures with as many devices as you want. And then any one of those will be authenticator okay. ready. Perfect. So I'm going to do it one more time. And I'm just going to have all my phones ready mm -hmm. and do it on all <laughs> of my phones. 18 in a row. Yeah. I am going to do that. I'm going to do it on, tablets. on tablets, on everything. Because I... It's nice to have authenticator in a variety of spots. Yeah. Good tip. That's a good tip, Matt Cutts. That, that QR code works more than once, in other words, if you keep it around, have it lying around. And now uh, Aaron uh, Newcomb's tip or tool. I love this one. Yeah. So, so yeah, Jeff kind of talked about it a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, no, no, that's okay. Because we, I mean, people give away your numbers regularly. So <laughs> <laughs> who would do that? Yeah. You don't have to Just apologize. Who? You don't have to Just. apologize at all. So earlier today, uh, at least it's the first time I saw it, Google released Google Maps Ocean or Oceans. This is so cool. Um, which is very cool. So uh, they actually have been taking pictures underwater in certain key areas, uh, touristy that's areas. Not. And they actually built a special camera that goes underwater. I mean, it's like a special rendition of the Google camera, the mobile Google camera that goes underwater. And they went and took all these amazingly cool underwater pictures. And you can actually now in Google Maps explore <laughs> underwater, literally. <laughs> um, so wild. Uh, just like Google Street View. Oh, and man. it is absolutely cool. I mean, we had uh, Open ROV on Floss Weekly a couple weeks ago who are building a little thing to go do this like by yourself. But to be able to actually go access this without having any equipment or anything, you know, you know, maybe you're afraid of going underwater or, you, don't, you know, you just always wanted to see what was down there. You can now actually go do that in Google Maps Ocean. So very, very, very cool. Wow. It's beautiful. These are beautiful. I mean, it's hard to yeah. get uh, underwater images this clear with so little back uh, scatter and stuff. This exactly. is great. Yeah. The camera equipment that they use must, must be have been fancy. really fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Wow. -wee. Google, it's like Google Sea View. Yeah, right. yeah. Sea View. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, and it's not on Apple Maps either. <laughs> they don't Just have to that point either. that out. They don't even have an ocean on Apple Maps. Yep. Uh, no, I'm just I'm kidding. I'm a kidder. Jeff Jarvis, <laughs> your number of the week. Uh well, um, I think it's interesting that Google stock uh, passed its all time high, which was seven forty eight ninety. It closed today at seven fifty three forty six. It was over 760. And the interesting thing to me is, according to International Business Times, that makes Google now, the, by market cap, the fifth largest corporation in the world. With an only a 5% gain, it would surpass Microsoft and ExxonMobil to become the third largest. Now, then there's still, uh, I'm sorry, no, it would surpass, let me get that right, uh, it's barely behind Walmart and mm. Microsoft. Uh, it would, so it could then become third behind Apple and ExxonMobil. There's still quite a bit of a gap there. Uh, market cap of Google is 245 billion. Market cap of Apple is 645 mm -hmm. billion. But you know when this maps thing plays out, you don't know where that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, hit them while they're down. <laughs> boom, boom, and 25 billion downloads, which was the yep. other one. Yep. 
Uh, oh, you want to talk about Nuzzle? All right, we could do Nuzzle as my tool. I don't think you have to be. It's a beta. Are you? Have, this is a Jonathan Abrams, the guy who started Friendster, has a um, thing called Nuzzle, which is a new news, uh, friend news. There's so many of these uh, social news aggregator kind of a thingamagob, and um, you have to sign up beta.nuzzle.com and then get invited. I did get invited, so here's what it would look like. And actually, it's a really good source. Did you do this? Did you put this in here, Chad? Because you're on Nuzzle. Who put this I, in here? Did this, you put this? I out? did. Me, Matt I'm Cuts. <laughs> Matt Cuts I snuck it in. I'm sorry. No, it, I needed I, a tool. I appreciate it. That's good. I was going to do CM10, but that's good. I like it. <laughs> so, so uh, this is this is Nuzzle, um, and it, I, it, you know, it's there's so many social news solutions, but I do like I particularly like this one because you see all the tweets. Um. Mm -hmm. It, it is, and you can you have settings in this too, uh, not just the 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 uh, how recently, but also how many friends. Uh, you could sort it by the number of friends who liked it, or the or sort it chronologically. Uh, you could show stories that say uh, at least ten friends retweeted this, so that's going to give you a very strong, uh, you know, indicator that this is a story your friends are following. We all know that Twitter is a really useful way. Uh, to find out what's going on. In fact, uh, you know, we were asking Steve Gibson last show how he keeps up with security. He says, I let people tell me on Twitter. Uh, you know, when somebody when somebody comes to me and says, hey, did uh, Andy Williams just die? What do I, Where do you go? You go to Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's the first thing you do. Well, we, the older people might. What What do young people do? Uh, go to Reddit. Andy, Andy who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but, they, but they ask on Twitter. They say, hey, who, uh, my dad's is? so sad. Why? Why is Dad sad? Because of Andy Williams. Who is that? Was he in the Beatles? <laughs> no, but it, uh, is that a journalism bubble that we go and look at Twitter uh, when somebody dies? I think you do that, Chad. Yeah. Where yeah, Chad oh, yeah. is a young, a young person. Oh, when it's it's funny because my litmus test was Balloon Boy. Like when the whole Balloon Boy thing was happening, and I was still in college, I where would, would you go to? Find I went the news? straight to Twitter. I didn't have a TV. You're not but even if you did, you won't watch CNN. No. They won't know about Balloon Boy for days. Right, right. <laughs> and even if they did, the video wouldn't be available for right. hours and hours. So uh, it's clear Twitter is a good signaling mechanism for breaking news. And this nuzzle, I think, is an interesting idea. And it's I've tried. You know, I've also tried Prismatic, which is a uh, Petra uh, Petra's uh, husband's business. Um, she's a Google engineer. She's a Gmail. Um, which is why I'm pointing at Matt Cutts as I try to remember <laughs> Petra Cross. That's it. Brad Cross. Bradley Cross is her husband. Um, that's another uh, social media play. There are quite a few of these social news play. And uh, I just love the idea of, you know, you don't have time to pay attention to Twitter all the time. So if you're in an eight-hour set of meetings, you can come here and you can just see what you've missed. Yeah, what did I miss? And if you go, yeah, and if you go all the way down to the bottom, they actually have something that's like 50 more stories and that will take out the people you follow but it will show stories from the people uh, they follow so you can kind of spread your uh, your viewpoint out a little bit that's a good that's actually a really good idea yeah. and then you can look at other people's nuzzle feeds yeah nuzzle is a nozzle with a you you're <laughs> in the nozzle i just got it <laughs> anyway thank you aaron newcomb from uh, oracle and more importantly from the source mm -hmm. follow yep. And obey. That's right. And you can watch me on Floss Weekly. You can also see me occasionally on All About Android. So, yeah. And he'll be uh, playing with Darnock and Jalad uh, September at, at Chuckles. Tanagra's Chuckle Hut. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually, if, hey, listen, if anybody wants to get this shirt, you can actually get it on Spreadshirt. Um, it's up there. It's available. And there's no commission for me, but I just put it available there so that people could. That is as geeky as you get can it. get. It's selling like hotcakes, and I didn't put any commission. What am I thinking? I should have. Wait, but did you design this? Uh, I did not design the actual logo, but I put it on the shirt and then put it, uh, made it available for people to actually get. How? So, so what would okay. I search for? Darnock. Uh, Darnock yeah. and July. <laughs> probably, probably it's the only Darnock T-shirt <laughs> on all of Spreadshirt. Let's I've got to have that so much. No. I'm going to make. it. Oh, it should be on there. Darmok. Yeah, Darmok. Oh, 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 Darmok. Oh, Darmok. Oh, now I know what you're... There it is. You look, there's a whole bunch of them. <laughs> oh, my God. That first one's mine, I think. <laughs> oh, my God. This is a meme. Yeah, yours is the best. Yours is... Yeah. Although, Shaka, when the walls fell, that's not bad either. That's pretty good. 
But uh, but I would go for the Darnock and Jalad at Tanagra. Darmok. <laughs> Darmok and Jalad at Tanagra. When the walls fell. <laughs> that's my that's my Picard. Which episode is that? Oh, I don't know. I think it's. Uh, Did you see that both both Jean Luc Picard and Captain Kirk were tweeting about bad Time Warner service? Oh, really? Yes, it was dueling captains. <laughs> Both of them on two different coasts have, were having trouble with their that. cable service. Wow. At we the same time. We teleport a man to the That's moon. discrimination. We can't get good cable service. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt Cuts. Come back soon. Thank you, Aaron Newcomb. You too. Of course, we'll see you next week. Maybe we'll see the new mommy, Jeff Jarvis. We I hope, hope so. so. Yeah. And Gina Trapani. All of our thoughts go to the moms. Our love and uh, support and happiness yeah. to uh, Gina and her wife for that episode. Um, perhaps you didn't know, but it was Star Trek The Next Generation in Season 5, Episode 2. Wow, really? Yes. Maybe <laughs> you knew that, Leo? If you had been following more closely, you would have remembered that. I have it in my captain's log. I've been writing down every event that happens right here. <laughs> oh, man. We in the business call it ST colon TNG 5 slash 2. You have a show title for it. <laughs> uh, uh, here is Sir Patrick hilarious. Stewart's tweet. All I wanted to do was set up a new account with Time Warner Cable, but 36 hours later, I've lost the will to live. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dramatic reading that really makes it right there. Yeah. I interviewed oh, him man. once. He's really just like that, by the way. He's just like that. He's a great Shakespearean actor, Sir Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Hope you enjoyed this week in Google. We do the show every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC on twit.tv. Watch after the fact. We're on demand at twit.tv slash twig. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on This Week in Google. <laughs>